Welcome, Joystick Justice League, to episode two of JGL Live. I'm Mike Frusius, your host, and this is my new weekly news roundup where I essentially give my analysis, critique, and insight into the best and worst headlines that I find across AAAs, Indies, as well as Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. So before I get started, need to kind of give you a heads up on why this episode came out a couple days later than I intended. Last week, as you might remember, I told you that I, my intention with this show is to get it out on the weekend so that we can kind of review the weekend news and then get ready for the coming week. Well, here we are sitting, it's, it's right now, it's Monday afternoon, I'm still recording this because I didn't really anticipate the strain of research that I was going to be facing last week. There were a lot of headlines and a lot of really interesting things going on. And by the time I actually got to wrap my head around it all on Saturday and Sunday, I kind of ran out of time for recording. So here we are a little bit late. I have a new strategy going forward for more of a daily news roundup to get myself ready for recording on the weekend. So hopefully you'll see it more of a timely, consistent fashion. But on the plus side, at least you won't have to wait as long for episode three to come out this coming weekend. So anyway... Um, so we're going to break down third party news in this first segment, move on to some Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo news after that, and then wrap up things with this other segment I like to call the Greek Speaks, where I talk about uh, various uh, issues within the game industry, things that are happening now or in the future, and it gives me a chance to kind of tackle one topic with some insight. So later on we're going to be talking about cloud gaming and what I'd like to see in the future of that. So. Back to our 30 party news roundup for this first segment of JGL Live. I want to talk about uh, what's happening not only in the AAA industry as a whole, but how that also relates to changes in the mobile industry that are being initiated by Apple. But let's get back to the AAA industry, and I want to talk about one game in particular, uh, Assassin's Creed Unity. Because I feel that as I read more and more news about this, like the game is about two weeks old. Okay, It came out on November 11th, it's been out for a couple weeks. And there's still a lot of negative press surrounding it that's playing it beyond the launch day issues of just, you know, bugs and online issues, but going even deeper. And, and I'm finding as I read more and more about Assassin's Creed Unity, I'm finding it's starting to represent what's wrong with the larger AAA industry as a whole. So I'll be honest. Another in the inst in the interest of transparency, I told you last week that I'm going to try to approach this show radio style, kind of putting myself in the mindset that I only have one try to get it done, and just record whatever comes up. Well, that hasn't really happened. It's actually literally taking me about 30 tries just to do this Assassin's Creed segment. So over time, you know, I'll get I'll, I'll work the kinks out, but it, it kind of shows you that there's just so much going on with this game that I, I need to wrap my head around it. So let's let's break it down. I mentioned that, yeah, the game has bugs, but that's not, that is kind of a big deal because it, it sh one thing I noticed from all the reviews and what, what was a common critique was that the game feels rushed, even more so than other years. And, and I was, and I was warning about this for a long time. Now, I'll admit that I'm not an Assassin's Creed fanboy. I've never finished an Assassin's Creed game. I've played quite a few of them. I tried one, I tried Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, three, and I had Black Flag for a spell last year before kind of giving it up on it. The series never really drew me in, but I, I do follow it. And I have a lot of friends who are really into the series and I, and I always ask for their opinions in addition just to reading, reading the regular professional reviews out there. And, and one thing they're all saying is that Beyond just the bugs from launch day and the online connectivity issues, there's inherent flaws that can't be changed in the game itself. Going down to what it, what amounts to be pretty much a mediocre story and a mediocre main character. And, and, and this is the problem I've been talking about with a long time where Ubisoft is annualizing the Assassin's Creed franchise and in my view, watering it down. The, you, you, when you have this triple A big budget experience, it's really hard to expect a bunch of developers to, to deliver that in a timely fashion year after year. It, it just kind of, it goes against the whole notion of artistry where you, you give the time that's needed to fully flesh out a project. That's why games like GTA V, by contrast, come out of the gate with a 97 Metacritic score because you know that at least five or six years of hard work has gone into crafting that experience and polishing it and making sure that it's good from day one. I'm not saying that GTA 5 isn't without its problems too. You know, it has some online connectivity issues on the PS4 that I've seen so far, 
But overall, from a game perspective, it's just a lot more polished. And, and I think, based on uh, an article I saw in Game Industry Biz last week, that Ubisoft Montreal is starting to respond to these criticisms about the dilution of the Assassin's Creed franchise. And they've even said that from now on going forward, the series is going to be handled on, on like a two-year development cycle, going back and forth between Ubisoft Montreal and Ubisoft Quebec, which I think is the right strategy. I, I, I see that they're learning from Activision's mistakes, where for the longest time, same thing with the Call of Duty series, it, it was coming out on a yearly basis, and it just felt like it was getting rushed out to, to, to meet that holiday sales window and that the product was suffering. And now... To kind of counter that, Activision has promised a three-year development cycle where Call of Duty will go between Sledgehammer Games, Infinity Ward, and Treyarch, and we're already starting to see the payoff. I mean, look how good Call of Duty Advanced Warfare turned out because Sledgehammer had the time to put the polish on the game to make sure it was working properly, that it was hitting out on all cylinders. And I'm hoping that Ubisoft is going to learn from their mistakes this year by not only putting out a rushed version of Unity, but also shoehorning in a last-gen Assassin's Creed in the form of Assassin's Creed Rogue. I mean, we just didn't need all that content. And, and you know, that's the funny thing, too. Looking at Gamergeddon last week, November 18th and beyond, where just pretty pretty much every game, major game, came out of, uh, under the sun on the same day. We had Far Cry 4, we had Dragon's Age Inquisition, GTA 5 Next Gen, Little Big Planet 3, WWE 2K15 for Next Gen, and then a couple of days after we had Smash Brothers. So while Assassin's Creed on PS4 may have been leading the global software charts until last week, it'll be interesting to see how it fares now that fellow Ubisoft game came, Far Cry 4 came out and has done better metacritically than Assassin's Creed did. I mean, really, most of the games that came out last week did better critically than Assassin's Creed did. Assassin's Creed sitting at about a 75 right now, and whereas Dragon's Age, Far Cry 4, and GTA 5 are all at least 85 or beyond. And it's funny because I was reading an article in Forbes last week that kind of got me thinking about this whole Assassin's Creed segment. It was written by Eric Kane, and he made some really good points about the trouble that Assassin's Creed might now face leading into holiday season, having all these bugs. And, and it's it's not just the bugs. It's not just the rust nature of the story. We're going to get into some other things that are kind of troubling Assassin's Creed too. But he made the good point about Metacritic and, and love or hate Metacritic. And I know the industry is divided on Metacritic. Some people think it should be abolished. I think it needs to be tweaked because it is important in making snap buying decisions and getting like kind of an, a, a bigger picture of the industry. But regardless, Assassin's Creed had about a week window on top of Gamer getting to, to get a 75 Metacritic score out the door. And, and yeah, it did well for the first week. It sold over a million copies. But Eric Kane makes a good point that is it going to survive that, that window of opportunity with all the problems it has, with all the negative press it's getting? And I, I think the problem, a lot of that problem may come down to the fact that Ubisoft unwisely chose to embargo the reviews for, for Assassin's Creed. Now, let's get into that for a second as to why that's important. And Jim, Jim Sterling on Jimquisition last week made a really good video. I think it was Review Ubisoft or something talking about review embargoes and how consumers are starting to wake up to what these embargoes really mean. So let's put this in perspective. Assassin's Creed, the reviews weren't allowed to go out publicly until the morning of Tuesday, November 11th, well after all of the midnight release people went and bought it, all of the people that woke up in the morning went and bought it. This didn't show up till 12 p.m. Eastern time on most review sites, so it was kind of a similar situation where you had to take your gamble. You couldn't read the review ahead of time. You had to just kind of say, okay, well, it's Assassin's Creed. I assume that it's going to be good. And for the most part, it was. But that's the thing. When, when the embargo was up and you start to see all of these mediocre reviews come out, you start to think back to games like Aliens, Colonial Marines, and the shitstorm that happened around that, the review embargo that, ha that, that forced the reviews to come out late, and suckers like me ended up buying it in advance thinking that it was going to be awesome when we found out it wasn't. 
Jim Sterling makes a really good point in the sense that people are getting wise to these review embargoes in the sense that it shows a lack of faith in the product. It, it, it kind of, when you see a game like Dragon's Inquisition come out by contrast, when the review comes out a week early, giving it like this stunning review, it shows faith in the product. Whereas by contrast, it shows that Ubisoft had reservations about Assassin's Creed. They knew they were rushing out. And I don't understand, like they had Far Cry 4 coming out. Why couldn't they have pushed Assassin's Creed till early next year? They, they could have done that. There were so many other games coming out that they could have just delayed it worked out the bugs, maybe rewritten some scenes or something and put out next year to much greater acclaim and maybe better sales. But now, because it's coming out in this glut of other more higher rated titles, it may get lost in the shuffle. It remains to be seen. I wanna see what the sales results are gonna be this week, but it just shows the problem with this whole holiday rush attitude that everybody needs to get their game out before Christmas. And unfortunately, some games are gonna suffer because they're trying to meet this stupid release window. We have to stop expecting that an Assassin's Creed game is gonna come out every November. It should come out when it's ready. But even beyond that, Monday and Matt, uh, not too long ago, uh, kind of, he's a big Assassin's Creed fan and he criticized the game on another level for its flagrant use of in-game microtransactions. And this is, this is starting to become a thing in a lot of AAA releases, more so than others, but it, it's, it's disconcerting, okay, to see that, that publishers are getting so greedy. And, and the one thing that Monday Matt said that really stuck out my mind and, and, re, and he really nailed it, he said that the stuff that you're buying in Assassin's Creed basically amounts to what we knew as cheat codes back in the 80s and 90s. And if you remember back in the 80s and 90s, you would put in a cheat code and you'd unlock something extra for your game. Now they've taken cheat codes and relabeled them in-game purchases, which I think is, is going to backfire. I mean, when you already have all this negative press around Assassin's Creed that the story is getting watered down, that it's getting rushed to market, it's coming out with bugs, it's not, it's, it's like half finished to further gouge the consumer and slap them in the face with in-game transactions that could that are already on disc that you have to pay to unlock is not good policy. All right? And this is leading into my next story about Apple. Apple was in the news last week in a similar vein. There's this major backlash towards not only free to play, but microtransactions. That's not only affecting Assassin's Creed, but the, the, the industry in general. If you watch South Park, you'll notice that the sixth episode of this 18th season was called Freemium Isn't Free, and they basically, what a brilliant episode. In a nutshell, the kids get their hands on this Terrence and Phillip mobile game that's similar to Clash of Clans, and it's one of those freemium pay to wait kind of games where you have to keep purchasing in-game consumables, and eventually Stan racks up this huge phone bill, and it forces them to go find out what's going on with the Minister of Mobile Gaming in Canada, who turns out to be Satan, explaining <laughs> the whole con psychology of how freemium isn't free and how the game loop forces you to spend more money with psychological cons. It's, it's, it's too hard to encapsulate that whole episode right here, but in effect, it nailed what a lot of us we're concerned about in terms of where not only the mobile industry is going, but the triple industry is going in terms of DLC and, and price gouging. And I think that the South Park episode was an effective mouthpiece. And I wouldn't say that it really directly led to what I'm gonna talk about with Apple to wrap things up here for this first segment, but it definitely had an effect. So getting back to Apple, article last week that Apple is getting out of the free to play business. So now, soon enough, you're not gonna see the word free anymore. When you go to the Apple I, the, the App Store, what used to be free is now gonna be relabeled with a get button. So this is essentially an alarm saying where the mobile industry is gonna be going from here on in. Apple is making a firm stance, responding to criticisms, and this really has to do with the 32.5 million dollar lawsuit that they recently settled, wherein a whole bunch of parents did this class action lawsuit complaining that their kids were racking up thousands of dollars in their phone bills because they weren't properly uh, inform they, they hadn't received proper informed consent and that was the whole issue so now not only is Apple now and a lot of mobile developers now required to put disclaimers in front of their game saying that this game will require in-game purchases to continue but now they've had to change their whole philosophy and how they market these games to the public and, and I think that kind of spells 
the end of this whole plague of, of freemium isn't free games in not only the mobile market but now the console market I have to wrap this up because this this section is going long. But I was reading GamesIndustry.biz and Glitchsoft CEO Andrew Fisher reports that mobile devs are, mobile developers are actually moving away from consumables on the whole. I mean, you're seeing this with Disney, EA, and GameLoft, and specifically Glitchsoft's Uncanny X Men: Days of Future Past game that recently came out is proposing this new structure that they want to go with for this new model where you pay up front for a premium game, a core game, two to three bucks. And then instead of being forced to buy consumables and microtransactions, if you like the game, they'll provide episodic content. So, regardless uh, of what 2000 happened in 2014, all the garbage we saw, and I, and I told people from the beginning that this was going to be a transition year for the industry. A lot of new things were happening, a lot of things were going to succeed, a lot of things were going to fail in terms of marketing, in terms of hype. We're seeing what went wrong, but now we're also starting to see what happened that's gonna be that's gonna be happening right. I can't even speak properly in 2015. And I think Apple has taken a, a great first step in, in pronouncing the the future attitude towards free to play and possibly the end of all this gouging. So we've run out of time for the first episode. That was kind of all over, all over the place, but you can kind of see my point as to why it's, it's good to see that Ubisoft is taking a better attitude towards the Assassin's Creed franchise and I think the whole industry can learn from that. Stay tuned, we're coming back with Sony News in part two after this JJL Live. Mike Freesis from Joystick Justice League. See you in a bit. Joystick Justice League to the second episode of JJL Live. This is part two where I cover all things good and bad in relation to Sony's PlayStation brand. So let's start off with the good. Some really exciting news uh, for fans of AAA shooters especially. We finally broke the radio silence on the status of Planetside 2 for the PS4, which if you don't know what it is, I'll kind of get you up to speed. Planetside 2 is a free-to-play first-person shooter MMO, which was made by Sony Online Entertainment, responsible for bringing us previous hits like EverQuest and DC Universe Online, which also which was ported over to the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4 consoles. So this game has already been out for a couple of years on the PC platform and has done really well. It has a very loyal, dedicated following, and uh, you know it doesn't hurt that the game received really great reviews when it came out. I believe IGN gave Planetside 2 an 8.9 out of 10, citing its its incredible graphics, its gameplay ambitious, and it's just it's large scale battles. I mean, I watch I haven't played it personally, but I've watched a lot of gameplay footage of it, and I've also spoken to people who have had direct experience with the game. It's this massive battlefield, and it's it's not uncommon to go from skirmish to skirmish and fight with up to 50 players, but using mechanics that are very, very similar to Halo. And that's what one of my friends, uh, Tethered, said, that if you like Halo, you're really going to like Planet Side 2, and, and especially Halo on like this massive massively multiplayer online scale. So you've got ground troops, you, have, you, you can take command of various vehicles, tanks, and, and uh, buggies, you can get into aircraft and, and, and do airstrikes. Really, there are so many different ways to play this game and, and it's definitely ambitious, there's a lot going on. And I think that's why uh, Sony Online Entertainment was so slow to give us details because they really wanted to make sure this was going to work on the PlayStation 4. It wasn't just going to be another kind of half-assed port like DC Universe Online. And Matt Higby speaking to Eurogamer last week um, said that when the beta finally arrives for the PS4 at the end of this year, you can expect to see certain things. For instance, the user interface, Higby claims, has been completely built rebuilt from the ground up for the PlayStation 4 console experience because they said that they didn't want to just simply port the PC game over to consoles. You know, that wouldn't do it justice. They wanted to make it feel, make the player feel as if this was designed for them. And, and I think this is a good thing to do because having played the port of DC Universe Online for the PlayStation 4 or PlayStation 3, it was admirable to see what they were trying to achieve. And for the most part, they, they did make it a fully functioning game, but there was a lot wanting in terms of 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 how 
the interface worked on an intuitive skill. It really felt like the game was designed for a mouse and keyboard and didn't translate exactly over to an experience where you use like a dual shock controller. So they, they, they're aiming to fix this and to make this work better on the console. But really what people want to know about is how this very ambitious, graphically heavy and action heavy game is going to work on the PlayStation 4 hardware. And, and as if you've been following, uh, you know, the, over the past year, we've been finding out slowly and slowly that the PlayStation 4 is a bit underpowered in terms of consistently providing 1080p, 60 frame a second experience, especially when it comes to shooters. So addressing these concerns, Higby said that the PS4 version will use the same ultra textures, full particle effects, and shadows and lighting effects from the PC version and that they are aiming to get this running at 1080p 60 frames a second. The key word here is aiming because he does go on later in the interview to say that if we have to settle on 30 frames a second, we will ensure that it has at least a fluid locked in 30 frames a second. And I think he's being realistic here. I think that this game is really ambitious to do on the PlayStation, ver the PlayStation 4 hardware alone. It it's admirable to, admirable to see them try and we'll see more of it in play next month when they finally reveal the game at the PlayStation uh, Experience event in Las Vegas from December 6th to 7th, which is most likely when they'll give us a firm date on the end of the year beta rollout and maybe more insight into the launch window in 2015. But regardless, we're gonna get to see the game in action. I don't think it's gonna be that big of a deal if initially Planet Side 2 is running at 30 frames a second. You know, as we've seen, you know, the Crucible on Destiny runs at 30 frames a second, and it is playable. Not as enjoyable as playing Call of Duty Advanced Warfare is at 60 frames, but it's possible. But if you stay tuned to the rest of this podcast, and when we get into the cloud gaming discussion at the end of this podcast in the Greek Speaks, I'm going to talk about how cloud gaming is going to change gaming going into the next couple of years, and how even if Planet Side 2 is running at a, at, a, at, a, at a lower settings than the PC counterpart, it's not going to matter over the long term because I think that Planet Side 2 is one of those experiences that it, it has a long term plan, it has a long term goal of becoming something better over time. We'll get over, into that over the course of this podcast. So, Planet Side 2 finally has a beta release coming at the end of the year. Stay tuned for more announcements as the PlayStation experience happens next month and I report on it. Also in Sony news, not really on the gaming front, but I see this as exciting news from a TV viewing perspective. And I know you're gonna, what you're gonna say, oh, why are you talking about TV capabilities on the PS4 or on, a, on a gaming podcast? And, and it just it's just really indicative of how Sony not only wants to innovate the video game space, but also wants to innovate the entertainment space as a whole and and it was funny last week sean Layden, the head of sony computer entertainment america was doing an investor call and just kind of casually revealed that playstation is getting into the tv business and they unveiled playstation view vue which is going to be their version of streaming television and it's very different from what microsoft's decided to do with the Xbox One and I'll get into, I'll, I'll try to explain because there's a lot of informa information I got to kind of pack into four minutes here about why I feel PlayStation View is going to be important. Sean Layden is saying that the TV industry has stagnated for like the last few decades. It hasn't really innovated much and what they're trying to do along with Dish Network and their similar streaming service which is going to come out next year is they're trying to reinvent the TV space. So PlayStation View is going to limited beta by the end of this year in limited markets. So we're talking about New York, LA, Chicago, Philadelphia, and then it's gonna be gradually rolled out to the rest of North America over the course of early 2015. So what they're promising is that unlike Xbox One TV, which requires a connect to function to do all the motion commands with your hands and requires an archaic set top box provided by your cable provider, which simply just passes through the Xbox One console to give you a new type of Xbox centric TV guide, the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 3 on the other hand, all you required is a broadband connection. You do not need a cable contract. They want to get out 
of the cable business. They wanna get cons people who are cord cutting. And this is gonna be a new term that's gonna gain ground in 2015 as you see more and more people severing their relationships with the old cable providers and looking for alternatives like Netflix, like HBO Go. Stuff that appeals to them without having to pay for an entire cable package of shows that, in featuring shows that they don't wanna see with all of these hidden costs which cable companies are notorious for. And, and what I, what I respect about Sony's approach to PlayStation View is that they're trying to be transparent. They're saying, look, like Netflix, you're gonna pay a monthly subscription fee and you are gonna get what you pay for. And if you stop paying, we're gonna cut you off. It's very simple. There's not gonna be any hidden fees like what Time Warner does in the US uh, with this thing, uh, what's it called? It's called, um, it's called teaser rate, okay? So basically they'll advertise this, you know, too good to be true cable rate suck you in and after about a year or two you find that your cable bill has doubled with all these hidden fees they're trying to eliminate that and try to get you into more of an experience that is controlled by you and what you want to see at, a, at like a lower monthly subscription cost so with the beta they're going to be rolling out about 75 functional channels that you can access right away via your playstation 4 ps3 and that's going to include some major heavy hitters which includes the cbs network the discovery network uh who else is on this list uh, NBC Universal, we have Viacom, which includes BT, Nickelodeon, MTV. The only ones that aren't on this list yet, and Sony says that these licensing deals do take time to go into effect, you're not gonna see Disney and Time Warner. So meaning ESPN, ABC, Disney Channel, HBO, those aren't currently available, but I think they have the right approach. And, and to see that Dish Network is doing something similar with their service, I, I think we this really is the death knell for television in the traditional sense, the whole idea that you have to go either rent a cable box or buy one flat out. Now you're just gonna use your PlayStation 4 or PlayStation, PlayStation 3 as your set-top box. I mean, look, it's PlayStation 4 is one of the fastest selling consoles of all time. It's getting into homes and people like me who have, have lost faith in the TV system, who have moved on to Netflix and streaming stuff online, I find this interesting, especially if they can get it down to say like a $30 per month price point. I like this because not only are you gonna be able to live stream television, but they're gonna leverage the power of the Gaikai Cloud to allow you to archive up to three days worth of material. So let's say you miss your, your favorite show, it's gonna be in the archive for three days. And not only that, but you can also smart tag your favorite shows so that they'll be available up to 28 days in the cloud. So really it remains to be seen not only how many more companies get on board I, I think the hbo factor is the big glaring omission i think hbo is kind of on top of the world right now and without hbo it's not really going to go to that next step but it shows that people want something different and that playstation is on top of the innovation ladder and, and, and addressing things that microsoft got wrong in its approach to providing tv through the xbox one they're making it simpler cheaper and more transparent, which is what we all want to see. So that's the end of the, uh, we've run out of time for the Sony news roundup. Uh, let it, like I said, like the, the comments below these videos are an open forum. If there's something I haven't gotten to or something I haven't addressed it, uh, feel free to sound off in the comments. And like I said earlier in the uh, earlier on, if I do miss any of the headlines that are on my agenda, I'll probably share them on my Facebook page for jo Joystick Justice League. So stay tuned. We'll be coming back with all things Microsoft in the next segment. I'm Mike Frusius for JJL Live. Stay tuned. Welcome back, Joystick Justice League, to episode two of JJL Live. I'm Mike Frisios. This is my new one-hour weekly news roundup podcast. And in part three for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to round up uh, the best and worst of what I saw on the Microsoft Xbox front last week. So let's start with some of the good news. For, for all of you diehard Xbox fans who have been a little worried about the state of your console in the next gen wars you know of course if you look at statistics right now the ps4 is still outselling the xbox by about a two to one ratio ps4 is currently sitting at about a 14.4 million 
consoles globally versus Xbox's 7.6, which has actually now overtaken the Wii U's 7.4 million consoles globally, but it is the holiday season. Smash Brothers is out, Master Chief Collection's out. Things are gonna change rapidly. We're already seeing that, and especially over the last couple of weeks. The Xbox One has ha seen a tremendous uptick in sales following the $50 price drop on many of its bundles, including the Call of Duty Advanced Warfare bundle and the bundle that comes with not only Assassin's Creed Unity, but also the critically acclaimed Assassin's Creed Black Flag from last year. And I think there's also another bundle with the Master Chief Collection. But regardless, now, including a, a premium AAA current game, you're getting the Xbox One, let's just say with that and Call of Duty for $350, $50 less than the PS4, which, arguably doesn't have the same clout going to the holiday season as the Xbox One does. I mean, when you really think about it, and Blake Jorgensen makes this point, you've got Sunset Overdrive, you've got Halo Master Chief Collection, plus all of these incredible third-party AAA titles that are running comparatively well to the PS4 counterpart. When you drop that $50 price tag, he sees that as giving Microsoft some incredible momentum through holiday 2014 to essentially close the generation gap by early 2015. He feels really confident that the Xbox is in fact gonna catch up to the PS4 next year. And, and I see some truth to what he's saying. My only reservation is that the PS4's lineup of exclusives is set to explode early next year, beginning in February with the Order 1886 and Bloodborne. So that could change again but he he does have some some merit and, and we do see it again in the last couple of weeks xbox ones are flying out the door Pe people want to play master chief collection now let's talk about the flip side of microsoft's fortunes yes things may look good theoretically going into holiday 2014 but let's look at the reality let's look at the crown jewel of the xbox one which is master chief collection okay fine so sunset overdrive worked out well AAAs are up and running well, but Master Chief Collection, almost two weeks after release, is still plagued with matchmaking problems. 343 Industries, like obviously we know that it's the, the online is virtually unplayable. It's it's hard to get into lobbies. And, and 343 promised that on November 20th of last week, they were gonna provide this massive update, which was supposed to fix all this. So November 20th, comes and goes and I'm, I'm paying attention to the news and I don't really see anything on even Reddit or, or NeoGAF about the state of the Master Chief Collection. I'm just seeing a lot more frustration. And then this past Saturday, November 22nd, I read Forbes and Paul Tassi, who is a big Halo fan, is going on about his ongoing frustrations with Master Chief Collection. And I had to check the date to be sure. I'm like, did you get the patch? Have you played it recently? Have you, have you updated the game? Yes, he in fact reported that he had patched the game and still, it was almost as if fixing certain problems created a whole plethora of new ones. And, and I see it through my own social media that people are still complaining. Apparently they've added the, the rumble mode to Halo 2, but a lot of the issues that were there still haven't been resolved. And this is, according to Tassie, really killing what could be good momentum on Microsoft's side, because I'm pretty sure he saw what Jorgensen was saying about Microsoft's positive momentum, and, and Tassie is simply stating his fears that with all this positive uptick in sales, the crown jewel that was supposed to be the slam dunk in Microsoft's holiday calendar is not working. And fine, you know, the campaign doesn't really have any problems. There's a few things that they fixed about it, but come on. We know why people play Halo. They've already played the campaign. Yes, they'll probably play it again, but people want to play online with their friends. And the longer this goes on and the longer they can't resolve these issues in a timely fashion going into the holiday when especially, you know, younger people are getting off of school and they want to go home and play some Halo with their friends. My fear is that with all these other amazing games that came out over the last couple of weeks, they're just gonna ignore Halo eventually. They're gonna get fed up. I see people already getting fed up. I mean, uh, Boogie2988 put out a Francis video, I think just about like a few hours ago, doing the typical Francis thing about fuming about how Halo still isn't working. I mean, this is the flagship title for the Xbox One. And if they couldn't get this right, geez, like what, like, can we expect anything from Halo 5? I mean, already 
the people who have had access to the Halo 5 beta are not that impressed. I mentioned this last week that Ryan McCaffrey said that he it didn't feel right. It felt very early, very unpolished. And I mean, and that's to be expected. I mean, they are revealing this beta a year ahead of time. And even, even Bonnie Ross, head of 343 Industries, says that they have a long-term plan for the series and that they are unveiling this beta early to get feedback ahead of time so that they can make Halo 5 and then eventually Halo 6 the best possible experience it can be. That's, that's all we can expect. That's why people buy Xboxes over PlayStations, so they can get Master Chief. But two weeks into this, and that's the thing, it's it's not just a bunch of nerds complaining on Reddit about problems with Master Chief. This is Forbes magazine complaining about what was supposed to be a no-brainer. And again, when, when people are at that zero hour trying to figure out what gifts to buy their loved ones, their gaming loved ones, are they going to go for Halo Master Chief Collection knowing how problematic it is, knowing that the people who created the franchise, Bungie, are now doing Destiny, already that they've already farmed it off to somebody else, and that they're not even proving themselves anymore. It, it's sad to see, and, I, and I'm gonna be paying attention to the news this week, keeping updated on Master Chief Collection, because the other problem, that the what we talked about last week, the new eSports League that 343 is trying to head up, which is called the Halo Championship Series, had to be delayed because of the multiplayer problem. So originally, the first preseason online cup was scheduled for November 16th. It got pushed up to yesterday, November 23rd, and I haven't seen a single article or reaction yet. Maybe something will be out by the time I get this video up and we can talk about it this coming weekend. But at this point, wow, this they're they're in like sim I'd say that 343 and Microsoft are heading into similar territory that EA was in with the botched launches of SimCity and Battlefield 4. I don't want to get into fear mongering because Halo is massive. It's not your regular video game. And the, the, the love that people have for Halo is going to transcend a bunch of first month launch window glitches that I know are going to get fixed over time. And I don't think it's going to have quite the, the alienating effect that I think Tassie feels that it's going to have. But he has a point, and Eric Kane made this as well, that when a game is getting slaughtered critically for, for, for game-breaking issues, and then when you contrast that against other games, similar games like, say, Far Cry 4, which has got an over 85 Metacritic score, when you have to pick between one or the other, which one are you going to buy for your kid to make sure they're not disappointed Christmas morning? You're going to get the plague-ridden Master Chief Collection, or the tight and polished Far Cry 4, or, or Destiny or any other competitor that, that is working and functioning properly. So something really, I'm going to be keeping track of over the course of the week and talking more about on the weekend. Hopefully there will be some good news for the state of that game. Uh, wow, we've got about another minute for Microsoft news here. So I just want to quickly talk about uh, Ori and the Blind Force, which is one of those indie, which is kind of the crown jewel in the indie side of the Xbox Library. This this game, when it was revealed at E3, has been getting tremendous buzz. It's essentially like this hand-drawn Metroidvania uh, kind of platformer with light RPG elements, and it, and it's very epic in scope. It has that kind of epic Disney feel to it in terms of like the graphics, the the incredible epic sound design. But it got delayed, so it's not coming out this holiday season, but that's not a big deal. This is actually probably a good delay. They said they're going to be putting more polish on it, so just in case you were expecting that you might see a late November or early December release for Ori in the Blind Forest, unfortunately, you're probably going to have to wait more until January or February, but that can't be a bad thing. It's only for polish. So that's Microsoft News. We'll be coming back in a bit. Oh, one more thing before I leave too, is that uh, if you are into retro gaming, uh, sorry, I just have to add this one little bit before I go to commercial break. If you're into retro gaming and you want to kind of see what the f struggling uh, Microsoft uh, television studios is up to, one of their first projects, which is Atari Game Over, is available free now on your 360, Xbox One, and even on the PC. So you can actually see a documentary about the recent New Mexico excavation for the buried Atari 2600 cartridges of ET the Extraterrestrial. So you can see that free on your Xbox right now. It's available as is the long awaited HBO Go app, which is now on Xbox One. So you can get your Boardwalk Empire and all that fun stuff on. So Mike Frucios for Joyce Justice League. Stay tuned for Nintendo News in part four coming up next.
Welcome back to Joystick Justice League to episode two of JJL Live. This is your Nintendo News Roundup with me analyzing the best and worst of Nintendo headlines from last week and getting you caught up and up to speed. So, as always, I love to start these segments off with the good news and then segue into the not so good. So a couple of things that were revealed about Nintendo's strategies going forward have me feeling really optimistic that they're finally learning to swim off of their island and get their heads wrapped around where video game is going, gaming is going into the 21st century. Starting with Nintendo's stance on DLC, which was kind of reiterated through an interview with VideoGamer.com and the creator of Super Smash Brothers, Masahiro Sakurai, last week, where he talked about the, the, the light controversy around the decision to make Mewtwo paid DLC for Super Smash Brothers, and essentially shedding light on, on speculation that the series might go into kind of like a corporate, you know, let's, let's, let's gouge the gamer for a whole bunch of extra DLC characters territory. And he assured that no, that's not in fact the case that Beyond Mewtwo, which is gonna roll out for free to people who bought both versions, 3DS and Wii U, both versions of Smash Brothers, they'll get that free in spring 2015. And then after that, people who only bought one version of the other will get to pay a small fee and get Mewtwo. But beyond that, Nintendo has no plans to, re to release any further DLC for Smash Brothers, which I applaud because essentially, Masahiro is saying that not only do, does Nintendo fear that fans are going to criticize them for tacking on content later, but essentially not having a clear vision from the front that had to be padded with extra add-on content and updates, whereas they're saying that we, we believe in the product so strongly that it's so well-balanced, polished, finely tuned that it is released from day one as it is. And that's what Nintendo is becoming more and more known for, especially in contrast to their competitors like Sony releasing a broken and unplayable drive club, Microsoft releasing a pretty much broken and unplayable multiplayer experience in Halo Master Chief, whereas every Nintendo game that comes out work from day one. Mario Kart, Super Smash Brothers, no online problems, no crazy patches, no game breaking bugs. They just work. And it shows it's evident uh, uh, of Nintendo's new, more conservative, flagship-centric strategy where they don't spend as many developing development dollars developing a ton of new IPs, but rather just fostering the ones that are gonna hold them through, up throughout the year and making sure that they get the highest rating possible when they come out from day one. So I do applaud them in taking that firm stance that they're not gonna gouge the consumer. It, it just shows that they're willing to listen to the community and what gamers are concerned about and, and trying to take the high ground, especially when they see their competition falling flat. Also positively in Nintendo's favor, some big news, not really for gamers in general. I don't think most gamers are gonna care about this specific news, but for content creators like myself and other people on YouTube or people who try to promote Nintendo through blogs or any other type of artistic endeavors, fan art, parodies, anything you name it, right? Reviews. It seems that Nintendo is starting to relax their draconian policies towards non-commercial con content creators as well. Wow, that was a mouthful. But let me break it down for you. Last week, there was this uh, Japanese video mashup festival called uh, Dwango, which is associated with uh, Japan's Nico Video Service. And they have this whole creative endorsement program, whereas for this festival where all the video makers get together to make their videos together, they brought in Nintendo to sponsor it. And according to NeoGAF, at the event, Nintendo president Satoru Iwata actually announced that for the purposes of that event and possibly beyond, Nintendo was gonna allow non-commercial video makers to use images of Mario and Zelda and Samus and Pokemon in their videos without restriction or copyright infringement or strikes or anything like that. Home run, awesome. This is what we've been waiting for for years because as we know, especially on YouTube, Nintendo is infamous for, for their control of their IPs in, in terms of like even like videos that are positively trying to promote the 3DS and the Wii U were getting taken down and getting strikes against their accounts for even daring to, to air a clip of like a Mario game. A and, and that was really controversial and even led certain big YouTubers like Review Tech USA, who has over 270,000 subscribers, to stop 
using Nintendo footage during his videos. If you've ever watched his videos, he likes to talk about certain issues and then put some gameplay footage over top of it as eye candy. And for a while, he, when he got his Wii U, he was doing that. But then after a few harassments from Nintendo, he stopped. And, and that's, that's bad because Nintendo, I think, is finally starting to realize that Twitch TV and YouTube are changing the way that the games are marketed and consumed by the public. It, it, the, the power is slowly being lifted from from sites like IGN and GameSpot and being given over to, to like independent content creators. And you can't get better free advertising like that. You can't get better word of mouth. And Nintendo finally understands that essentially over the last few months, it's word of mouth that has been propelling Nintendo's fortunes. The fact that it almost seems that when you were when you read all the gaming trains, they're all trades. They're all kind of united in this whole, we need to get together and give Nintendo a boost. Give them some extra promotion. Like announce that they won E3. Whether that's right or not, it just seems like the community rallied around Nintendo this year and which resulted in a lot of positive press, a lot of great hype, which was justified with great day one releases. And like I said, in the short term, this is working for Nintendo, but on the flip side, I read an article, an interview actually, that Shigeru Miyamoto, of course, the creator of Mario and Zelda, Pikmin, and gaming as we pretty much know it, had an interview with The Telegraph last week, which, as excited as I am to see Nintendo evolving and trying to, to break through some of its old policies, then I see Shigeru Miyamoto saying things about the competition which, which make me think the opposite, that maybe they're still kind of stuck in their ways and... And that maybe the old guys running the, can the the company need to start getting some new blood in there with some fresh ideas. So let's kind of, for the last few three minutes here of this segment, let's break down the interview that Miyamoto did with the Telegraph concerning his, his stance of Nintendo in relation to the PS4 and the Xbox, the Wii U. So he basically said that the PS4 and the Xbox One, they're, while they may be good for business, they're boring. And in a sense that they have the same games on every system, they're always our annual, like they're always arguing about frame rate and resolution. Whereas he feels that Nintendo culture allows for ideas that haven't been done before and that create experiences that are unique to film and literature. So I, I get what he's saying, but the problem is, is that that sentiment is based on IPs and not actual reality of what's happening in the market. I understand that the Nintendo IPs are probably the strongest out of them all, rivaled only maybe by like Halo and like World of Warcraft and stuff like that. But really the, the, the landscape has changed. You know, we, we, we see how diverse the gaming libraries are on the competition, whether it's the PS4 or the Xbox One, there's something for everybody. There's something for your hardcore gamer, there's something for your casual, there's something for everybody in between. And for people who can't play Mario Kart, who don't have a Wii U, who can't play, like myself, who can't play Mario Kart or Smash Brothers or Mario World or Mario, there are games that are similar, that are still very good. For instance, I may not be able to play Super Mario U, but I can play Rayman Legends, a very similar type of game. So. Another thing he said was that he worried that young developers are too hung up on creating epic emotional storylines and have deprioritized the idea of play. And, and essentially he never even thought of himself as a storyteller, but a game creator. And this goes back to what I was saying about Nintendo being stuck in, in, in old school thinking that they don't understand that, that storytelling has arguably been reinvented by video gaming and, and that that hardcore game experiences that are that are pure, like Mario Kart, Smash Brothers, which are not about story, but about gameplay mechanics, are also widely available on other consoles in addition to the story-driven games. And let's not forget last year, which really opened up everybody's eyes to the possibilities that video games could eventually overtake movies as the most popular storytelling medium. I mean, look at Walking Dead, Telltale. Look at The Last of Us. Look at other examples like, like Skyrim and, and these new ways to tell stories that are indeed unique to video gaming in addition to the interactivity which Mio talk, Miyamoto talks about. Um, wow, I'm already running out of time. What else did he say? He, he was basically saying that he's kind of sick of seeing all these, these games that are born of a boardroom, that Nintendo, 
I guess that they have more unique titles, that they're they're not as corporate. Again, that that ignores though the third parties. Um, ability to bring out auteurs like Ken Levine, like Tim Schafer. You know, it, it just, overall, I understand what he's saying, that Nintendo is unique in their philosophies, that they have characters that are more widely recognizable than, than any of the Master Chiefs and Nathan Drake's combined, but it also shows an unwillingness and a one-sidedness to accept what the competition is doing right, that they the competition is catching up, that Sony is building its own brands, that Microsoft, to a lesser extent, is also building its own dynasty. And and if they keep if they continue to just gouge their IPs without accepting the fact that games are evolving, that they that cinematic games can coexist alongside more hardcore experiences, they're gonna get left in the dust. I'm out of time for Nintendo. Sound off in the comments if you have anything to add to that. But I just, I, I, I just, I, again, Miyamoto, I, I understand that, that gaming is different from movies and literature, but it's not to say that gaming can't take what's already been done in other mediums and take it into a new level that couldn't ever be done previously. So keep that in mind, Nintendo, going to the future. I'll be back for the final part, The Greek Speaks, coming up next where I talk about my N64 approach to the future of cloud gaming. Stay tuned. Welcome back, Joystick Justice League, to the final part, the fifth part of the second episode of JGL Live. This is a regular segment I like to term the Greek Speaks, where I give my own personal insight and analysis into a particular issue or topic so I can talk more at length about it and deeper than I would in just a kind of a typical news rundown in the previous segment. So today's topic, this week's topic, is going to be about cloud gaming and my hopeful N64 approach that I would like to see developers take towards it. So what do I mean by that? Well, why bring the N64 into this? Let's explain. Back in the N64 days, about halfway through the generation, uh, I think it was around the time that, uh, around the same week I think that Star Wars Episode One Racer came out, Nintendo unveiled an expansion pack that you could replace in the front of your N64, which gave a boost a huge boost actually to in-game textures, resolution, effectively making it like an N64.5 in a sense, like just much better looking. And they and they essentially used Star Wars Episode and Racer to kind of demo the technology showing the before and after. It was pretty incredible, almost to the point where you, you couldn't play it, Episode 1 Racer, without the expansion pack because it was just so muddy and blurry. And and Ocarina of Time, Zelda had already been out for some time and I was used to playing it the way it looked but when i put in the expansion pack i was like wow just blown away by how crisp much crisper it looked and and how much closer it looked to uh, uh like the pc emulator version that people were, were running at the time but regardless it, it was a nice way to kind of revisit some of your older games not not every game was affected by the expansion pack but it definitely re-energized a lot of stuff and gave the n64 a little bit more shelf life throughout that, uh, what was it, the fifth generation? That was the fifth generation, yes. So fast forward today. We're currently in the eighth console generation. And although sales are actually really, really good right now, um, in fact, uh, going back to what I was talking about earlier in the Microsoft segment, um, Blake Jorgensen was talking about the increase in Xbox's momentum. And he also mentioned that on the whole, between PS4 and Xbox One, that console sales are actually 50 to 60% better than they were around this time in the seventh generation. So that's good overall. But the PC master race is always rearing its ugly head. The, the console haters want to always harp upon the fact that based on visual certain visual tests and announcements by developers and revelations that the PS4 and the Xbox One, in comparison to your average gaming PC, are tremendously underpowered and, and can, can barely hold up doing 1080p 60 frames on most games. We, we've seen that, we've dealt with the, the criticism. We, we also know that 
Xbox One versions of AAA third-party games are getting better on the whole. They're still not up to the PS4 level, but it's getting more identical by the day. Regardless, a big bombshell came out last week about Metal Gear Solid 5. I think it was on NeoGAF, can't recall exactly right now, I'll have to check that later, but uh, they essentially showed some very alarming side-by-side -side comparisons of Metal Gear Solid 5, the Phantom Pain, running on a PC at Ultra Settings versus the PS4. And while some people would like, would like to say that it's like a night and day difference, I, I did notice some things that were missing in the PS4 version of the game, like such as extra plant life like cacti, certain reflections on windows, certain lighting on boxes. There was definitely a little bit more oomph to the PC, but nothing to really make you truly concerned if you're a PS4 owner. It's just more like light cosmetic stuff that you're probably never really going to notice anyway. But regardless, that was really the final proof in the pudding that, you know, the PS4 just, as on its own, cannot do what your average gaming PC that costs, what, maybe six, seven hundred bucks can do uh, with, without, uh, with, with little effort. So, it's, it, it got me thinking a lot about cloud gaming and, and it made me, seeing the, the, the fear mongering that was happening from the PC latest and calling for the end of the consoles and uh, an early end to the eighth generation. I, I think IGN actually did an interview with Mark Cerny asking him based on all of the criticism that both next gen systems are getting, whether they would consider doing a PS 4.5, maybe like four or five years down the road, what, what the likelihood would be of something like that happening, similarly to what, you know, kind of similarly to what Sega did with the 32X back in the third generation, no, fourth generation, sorry. And uh, he didn't really have any comment. I don't see that as unrealistic, but now when we get into cloud gaming and what I'm gonna kind of explain is as how I see it fitting into gaming design and, and you can approach cloud gaming from a whole whack of angles. I mean, there's so many ways that you can, you can use it to your advantage. I want to kind of approach cloud gaming in this particular discussion from the angle of how it can enhance what is currently available on the market and thereby close that gap between the PC and the PS4, or at least make it a lot more narrow than it is right now. And I'm telling you right now, based on my rudimentary research into cloud gaming, really, we, we only know the tip of the iceberg of what cloud gaming can do for us. But based on watching videos, listening to lectures, I've kind of gleaned the fact that, in theory, the power of the cloud can enhance the game that you're playing in the same way that the expansion pack enhanced existing N64 games back in the fifth generation. So, essentially the idea is that, let's take a game like Destiny, for example. This, this is gonna kinda play into my theory. Destiny as it is right now is kinda um, underwhelming from a next generation perspective. It, it barely runs at 1080p on both platforms. Um, it runs at it like a, a, an off 30 frames a second leading to some strobe effects. It, it really doesn't look much different from a seventh generation game. And in all honesty, it really doesn't. What makes it next gen is its online connectivity and its ambitions in that regard. But graphically, it's kind of a dog, all right? Not a big deal, but when it's Bungie and a $500 million budget, you expect a bit more. And, and I think that has to do more with the fact the limitations on PS4 and Xbox One have to do with the fact that they were trying to make it comparable on the PS3 and Xbox 360, which I think was a huge mistake and would have made Destiny better. But regardless, it doesn't matter. Going to the future, if developers decide to, 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 to get in on what I'm about to talk about, this could change the direction of the eighth console generation only in the positive. So, so, so stick with me for a second. Let's just imagine, even because Destiny is actually a game that's always online anyway. You can't play that game online, offline, unless I think you're doing just the story missions. But for most of it, you're gonna wanna play online. If the game's already online all the time anyway, why not connect it to the cloud and bump up the textures, the resolution, and the frame rate, okay? Why not connect to that to the cloud, bring it up to full 1080p, bring it up to 60 frames, and get people who are on the fence about that game back into it. Like, just announced like that, that Destiny is being revamped, 
and brought into the next generation via the power of the cloud. That is a nice way to get us through this eighth generation until the ninth generation when I can guarantee you that the PS5 and the Xbox 2 or whatever they're gonna be called are gonna be 4K out of the box. There's no question in my mind they're gonna to have to make it work to stay relevant. In the meantime, what I gather from the future of cloud gaming is that one day the specs on your console or your PC won't make a difference. It'll be a set-top box. And what it's really gonna come down to, what's really gonna make you stand out from your friends is how fast your internet speed is, all right? So how fast you can download the information from the cloud and send it back, how, how well you can connect to the other computers doing the same thing and contribute to that cloud network is gonna be up to your internet provider. And of course, even in Canada here, we're seeing internet speeds going up monthly and packages going down in price. So. It, it, Gaming is, is definitely, I think, driving that charge, especially streaming like YouTube and Netflix, but really gaming and having a connection to not only play latency-free online, but also to stream games at 1080p is, is becoming mandatory. I know that companies are gonna catch up in that regard. So, is this a reality? Yes, okay, absolutely. I saw an interview recently with the developers of Just Cause 3, which recently got announced for next gen, which is coming next year, which is uh, from Swedish developer Avalanche and published by Square Enix. And already, that they're, so what's happening now is that they're, they're promising this great single player experience. But when they were interviewed, and uh, let me just see who did the interview here. It was an interview with Game Informer. They were asked if they were gonna ever expand Just Cause 3 with stuff like multiplayer and better graphics once they like once the game was out and everything like that. And he said, I'm not gonna say yet. I'm paraphrasing now, but I'm not gonna say yet, but it is possible with the power of the cloud, aka Shinra Technologies, which has been recently purchased by Square Enix, with the power of the cloud, it is possible we could eventually add a fully flesh multiplayer mode and increase the resolutions and the textures and the frame rate of what you see in the game. So already, it's like, I, 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 I've been theorizing about this for so long and seeing the way that cloud gaming has been used so far, it was like I was going blue in the face thinking, when is somebody going to say we're going to use it to enhance current gen graphics beyond the capabilities of just the native hardware inside the Xbox One and the PS4? When are they going to start viewing that thing as a set-top box and use the internet, the power of the internet, to cover the rest? Well, it seems like those days are finally materializing. And I think now that there's a mild controversy around the differences between the PS4 version of Metal Gear Solid V versus the PC version, I'm hoping that Kojima's got his antennas out there and saying, all right, well, maybe it's time to make a couple of calls to Gaikai and see how we can take the Phantom Pain on the PS4 to the next level, in addition to using Xbox's cloud service as well. But I mean, up until now recently, cloud, cloud gaming, all we knew about it was the fact that you could, it was powering Titanfall to create very stable online connections and large multiplayer lobbies and that it was being used on PlayStation to allow you to stream old PlayStation games to your PS4 and your Vita. And and now we also know that the, the cloud will be used to store up to three days of television programming on the upcoming PlayStation View service. But now we're really starting to see what, I, what I've been hoping for, that the fact that the days of arguing over resolution and, and which system's more powerful is eventually gonna become irrelevant. And, and what I see happening in the future are a few things. Now, first of all, people are gonna criticize me and say, well, Mike, that's great if, if you can run Destiny at 1080p and 60 frames a second using the cloud, but what happens if your internet goes down or the, the PlayStation network goes down or the Xbox Live network goes down? What, what happens then? Uh, and my solution, give the players a choice. Allow for like a dumbed down offline version as well. So you get one version, it's, it's kind of like going back to the N64 where you play Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time without the expansion cart, and it looks one way, and then you play it with the expansion cart, but the gameplay doesn't fundamentally change. It just looks better or worse, depending. So same thing with, say, a game like Destiny. It looks just like it looks now when you're offline or not connected to the cloud, but when you're online, 
boom, you get that extra help from the internet to, to increase those textures and that resolution. And like I said, you do that and people will come back to Destiny. People who were on the fence or, or still outright hate it. And I know that there's a loyal community, but there's so many other games that could benefit from this. Maybe through the cloud, we'll, we'll see less of, of, of these problems that are, are happening with like Assassin's Creed Unity and Ma Master Chief Collection. Like imagine Master Chief Collection was using the power of the cloud right now. Maybe we, 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 wouldn't, we wouldn't be seeing these matchmaking problems, but it's still, early in the technology and that's why I would also say a lot of these games that are broken now never write them out because they might be fixed later look back at history look at the orange box the half-life collection for the ps3 which was considered dead on arrival when it arrived in its shipment form but after it was patched about 10 times later it was brought up to the level of the 360 version but most people didn't know that because most people didn't have a PS3 that early in the generation, didn't even play or realize that Orange Box came out for it. But again, it, by, by, by starting to understand that the cloud can be used for just more than just strengthening online connections and, and streaming old games by actually enhancing the games themselves beyond the capabilities of the hardware, which I think is powerful enough if you connect to the internet to do whatever a PC can, and carries into the PS5, PS5 generation. So that's my challenge now and I, to developers to start learning the cloud and, and to take old games and reinvigorate them. I mean, you can even take classic games and remaster them without having to make people pay for a second version. Just take that old version they already know already. Running out of time, it's pretty much the end of the, the segment. Um, like I said, if you have any comments or, or uh, debates about this topic, sound off in the comments. But one last thing I wanna add as a, as a tool for advice to keep Microsoft, Nintendo, Sony, and any other competitors competitive and separate so that this doesn't fall into like one monopoly where we all just use one set top box and play all the same games. I don't want to see that. that. That doesn't cause for innovation. What I want to see instead is for a variation on what the companies are already doing now, which is in the PS5 generation, you're going to buy a set top box that either it plays it one way or pl connects to the internet and plays it a better way. A and to play Uncharted, you will have to get that set top box and you will have to subscribe to the PlayStation Network. But then you also have the advantage that no matter whether you go to Microsoft, Sony or Nintendo, the third party games that are common across all platforms will look and run identical. And that is all that we want. So Mike Frucios for the Joystick Justice League. This has been the second episode of JJL Live. Again, a little bit later coming out than I thought, but uh, that just means that you won't have to wait much longer for the next episode coming up this weekend. So peace and game on, guys. We'll see you soon.